Hello my friends, welcome back to another story in the life of the old time rock and roller. This episode is called Rock and Roll Fever, 1964 to 1969, a cultural revolution. Now before we get started, this was a long time ago, so I'm going to set the time machine back to December 25th, 1964 Christmas Day and this is where our story will begin 59 years ago today was an incredible time for me I got my first electric guitar for Christmas just a few days ago it was an $87 Japanese Kent guitar. It was terrible, I admit. I had to plug it in through the back of my dad's hi-fi using a converter plug to an RCA jack and use the hi-fi on auxiliary to work as a guitar amplifier. This was a crucial time because just a couple of days later, I would make my first professional appearance at the Harrisville Civic Center in Pasco, Rhode Island with a band we called the Seagram Seven, which consisted of a bunch of camp counselors. And we were terrible, but we played the songs the people wanted to hear. And that was the important thing. Of course, being kids with our first electric instruments, we didn't know much. In fact, the drummer, Ed Riccio, was not really a good drummer, but he had a fake ID and a driver's license. He was 16 and that got him into the band. But my piano player, Bob Wiegan, who later changed his last name to Bob Weekend. He was a great piano player and a drummer before that. So he got up and played Wipeout by the Ventures and Ed Riccio went out for a smoke. We played Walk Don't Run, do 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 do. But the rhythm guitar player didn't know the bridge chords. So he flipped his amp off during the bridge. But we got through the night, we split the money, and we went to the New York system in North Providence, Rhode Island, and we got four chili dogs and a Coke for a dollar. Well, this was really exciting because we had six dollars a piece. We I think we got two dollars in the tip jar, and all of a sudden I was a professional musician. Well, that was 59 years ago, coming up on this New Year's Eve, 2024. It didn't take long after that first job to realize we needed some personnel changes. So Bob Wiegand, he was gonna be the keyboard player. His parents made him take classical piano. So he picked right up on the Young Rascals and the Animals and those keyboard driven songs. Our singer was another camp counselor named Paul Lister. Everybody called him Tiny because he was kind of big for his age. And he was, I believe, a grade ahead of me. And we didn't have a PA system, but he had so much power in his voice, he could project out into the room without a microphone. John Holscher was the rhythm guitar player. He and I shared a cabin together. And often we would listen to the Rolling Stones, songs like It's All Over Now, because Keith Richards played probably one of his best guitar solos on that. And we both tried to learn it. And as it would turn out, it was written by a guy named B and C Womack. That was Bobby and his brother Cecil Womack. Well, it wasn't until, gosh, 40 years later or something that 
I actually recorded an, an album with Bobby Womack. But back then, I was just a kid with stars in my eyes, like everybody else. Get a guitar, join a rock and roll band, and learn how to play. We used to say, well, we didn't want to have jobs, and we wanted to have a lot of girlfriends. So that was many guys' motivation for being in a band. It was kind of like a little boys club. Well, we needed a bass player and a good drummer. Well, we found David Brooks, who was uh, three years my senior, and he had been in a successful group in Pawtucket, Rhode Island called The Lords. I don't know why he wanted to join our group, except we were all at camp together and we had time to practice and it made sense. So we started rehearsing, putting together a song list. We entered a battle of the bands and realized that we needed official suits. So we all went down to Flag Brothers shoe store and bought the Beetle boots and got the jeans the same color, had powder blue shirts with black knit ties and blue blazers, and that was our winter uniform. We were not good at all, and we didn't have a bass player, so Bob would cover the bass parts on the piano. I believe Tiny got us our first job at the Episcopal Church in Middletown, Rhode Island. One good thing about the fact that we all came from the same church was there was a built-in job for us at every one of their dances. And that gave us some experience. Well, the spring rolled around and I got a call from a guy at Sigma Nu Fraternity at Brown University. And he said, hey, I heard about the Oxbow incidents. Can you guys play a fraternity party at Sigma Nu on uh, April 12th? I said, sure, we can do it, no problem. How much? He said, we can pay you $40. And I thought, oh, that was great. Now there's only five of us, so it'll be $8 a piece. A few minutes after he called, I thought, this has got to be a joke. Nobody knows who we are. So I got, opened the phone book to Brown University and found the Sigma Nu fraternity and called them back. And sure enough, it was legit. So that was the first of the drunken frat parties that we started playing. At the same time, we played at my junior high school in ninth grade. And then when I went to high school in 10th grade, we started getting high school dances all over the state, combined with the church dances and the occasional frat party. And now we were getting other colleges. University of Rhode Island, for instance. We sometimes would throw our own shows. One time we needed some transportation. We had a Volkswagen bus, and my sister Kathy was a great artist, and she painted all of this psychedelic stuff on the side of the bus, and we had a vanity plate. We didn't have a name for the group, so Kathy suggested how about the Oxbow Incidents after the book where some hanging took place. So we thought that was a good idea. We had business cards printed up, the OBI, Oxbow Incidents for parties, dances, and hangings. And we got quite a few calls and our local reputation began to spread. There was a group called the Cow Sills from Newport. Bud Cowsill had a lot of money and a singing family. He opened up a club and we got to play there with another Rhode Island group called the Merging Traffic and the Cowsills and a few other people. Well, Being in the band was not only like being in a boys club, but it was a camaraderie. When there's one guy trying to do it, it's one thing. When there's five people united going for the same thing, trying to make good music, it becomes something altogether else. And it's like you have a field of armor around you, actually. 
Now in 1965, the Beatles came out with Rubber Soul and they did The Word, a John Lennon song. And The Word was love. And that was kind of the beginning of the peace and the love movement, if you will. The Beatles artistically always led the movement for everybody else. As soon as they got onto something new, like on Revolver using tape loops, never before heard before, taking a studio from something that just records to making the studio an instrument. And so as soon as the Beatles would release another revolutionary album, everybody else would be trying to copy it. With Rubber Soul, they had Norwegian Wood and Michelle and Baby You Can Drive My Car. Just incredible songs. Well, before long, we realized we needed a recording. So Dave and I found that there was a little recording studio in the Crown Hotel, and we had to go talk to a guy named Myron Arnold. So Dave and I went up there and we talked to Myron and he was enamored with uh, the song Winchester Cathedral. He kept saying, that's a hell of a song, that's a hell of a song. I said, well, Myron, you know, can we record here? And he said, yeah, I'll charge you this much, but you might want to come by and see a live band perform for a live recording before you make any commitment. So we did, and it was a group called The Strange Loves that had a song called I Want Candy. It was kind of suggestive and cool, and we saw them in their dressing room, and they had on normal clothes, jeans and, you know, cool t-shirts like this, and we heard them say, now we got to put on these monkey suits. So they put on their spandex leather jungle looking things, and went out and did candy and later we made our first recording there. We played for about a year with Tiny and every Friday at the Episcopal Conference Center they used to have a square dance and that's where I learned square dancing. It was a lot of fun but since we were a band and they knew they could get us to play for free and everyone at the camp loved us, we started playing every Friday night for the camp dances. And then they would let us go play at the Psychedelic Rabbit in Taunton. I remember Purple Haze had just come out, and that was a mind-blowing thing. Well, we realized we needed a bass player, and probably a better singer. We had obtained a microphone, a really nice sure microphone, where you see these old-timey people singing out of. My brother-in-law at the time, Brian Rohde, borrowed it from the Coast Guard base where he was stationed in New London. We never gave it back, but at a wild party one weekend at my house, Bob, the keyboard player, threw it in the ocean. He was sick of it, and we bought the little Shure pistol SM57, 56, whatever it was. Well, we were lamenting at home on a weekend the band would always come down. My mom supported the group like 110%. The guys would all stay over on Friday night and would play and try and find some wine or something to drink. And then would practice again on Saturday morning and their moms and dads would come pick them up and off they'd go. Well, we decided, all right, unfortunately, Tiny, he was a great friend of ours, but we had to tell him that we needed a better singer. And I guess I was the leader of the band, so the band said, well, you gotta tell him. And I called him and told him, and it was tough. So we thought, well, who are we gonna get? And I heard about a guy named Chip Tucker, who was from East Providence, and he went to Moses Brown it was a private school. So he, I guess he was kind of well off. And I called him on the phone and said, Chip, you know, this is Howie McDonald and we're looking for a singer for our band. He says, well, I'd like to join a band. And I said, well, 
can you audition for me on the phone? And he thought it was a little strange, but he said, okay. So he took out his guitar, acoustic, and played uh, the Beatles song. I get high when I see you go by. He finished the song, I said, you're hired. So everybody was cool with that. And we started rehearsing with Chip at Bob Wiegand's house on Nayat Road in Barrington, Rhode Island. Bob and I went to the same schools and lived in the same town. He was a year younger than me. Well, during the summer, I guess we played for a year with Chip. And then he announced in the fall that he was going away to prep school and wouldn't be available anymore. Well, there was another, not, I wouldn't say they were a rival group, but another good group from Barrington called the Midnight Hour. All guys from my class and one good guitar player named Tom Jones. He was in Bob's class. So we went and saw them play one day and we called Jack up and said, hey, how would you like to join the Oxbow Incidents? And he said, yeah, let's do it. I said, well, come over to my house and let me audition you. So he said, okay. So he came over and he had some maracas and uh, he sang, I can't get no satisfaction and for your love by the Yardbirds that we were doing. So we hired him on the spot. And we said, well, Jack, you need to get a bass because we don't have a bass player either. So I believe Jack borrowed a bass for a couple of rehearsals, but our, our prayers were answered when Jim Carr moved in from Kansas City. And he had his own bass, it was a guild, and maybe a small Vox amplifier. And Jim lived across the street from Bob about four doors up. One afternoon, Bob was playing the organ and a friend of his, a couple doors down, came over with the guitar and they were kind of jamming and Jim heard it. And he walked over and said, hey, you guys want a bass player to join your jam session? And they, they said, sure. Jim rolled his equipment over and he was really good. So Bob called me up right away and said, hey, we got to get this guy in the band. So we had a full rehearsal with Jim. And I recall Jim thinking, and he told me this many years later, he said, boy, these guys, the drummer's good, the keyboard player's good, these two guitar players don't know anything, but they've got some jobs, so I'm going to do it. Jim and I became pretty good friends. In fact, I remember it in homeroom in 10th grade, he walked in and he put the first Cream album down on my desk. I said, wow, this looks heavy. So after school, we went over and we listened to it and it was just mind blowing, of course. So in 1967, when Lennon finally came out and said, all you need is love. Man, we were all for it. Everybody was for it. We were rebelling against our parents, really. And we were taking it with the music, one step at a time. But the Beatles, for me and our group, they led the movement. We weren't good enough to play the majority of their songs, even a small fraction. So we got more into the animals and the kinks and the yard birds and you know guitar bands eric clapton john mayall and the blues breakers john holsher and i got that at the same time and we listened to pretty woman and so many great songs were coming out of england the U.S. was pretty stale for music. There, we had the Paul Butterfield Blues Band with Mike Bloomfield on guitar, and he was one of my big influences. When we were at camp, Dave Brooks had a friend who was actually in my grade, class of 68, Bruce McRae. He was really excellent on the harmonica, 
and I challenged him to learn Paul Butterfield's The Work Song. And he got the intro and the first few notes of the solo just perfect. So he'd often sit in with us at some of our gigs. He was a great supporter. As the Oxbow incidents, we worked hard to get the up and coming gigs where everybody was playing at. There was a club in Newport, Rhode Island called the Bastille, and it was circular. And it was really acoustically terrible unless the place was completely packed. There was a group called the Pigeons from Long Island that had everybody going in the summer of 67. It turned out they were the Vanilla Fudge and they had a great big hit with the Supremes, You Keep Me Hanging On. Well, we finally got in the Bastille, and actually I was almost killed when I left that place after our job. I was driving my mom's Hillman Husky filled with the gear. It was pea soup fog. I started up, got halfway into the one lane of the oncoming traffic, and it stalled out on me and an incoming car stopped I mean, that close because it couldn't see the fog and me, but it finally did. One time our van broke down, it needed repairs. So we, I had a bunch of raffle tickets printed up and the winner got our band to perform at a private party for them for free. So we sold the tickets for a dollar and we raised enough to get the van fixed. And then everybody was in the auditorium and it was time to draw the notes, the, the winner. Well, we had made an ally of a guy named John Thomas. He worked in the AV lab. He was a student like us, but he had the keys. So after school closed on a Friday, he'd come back and it'd pick up the overhead projector. And those were in the days when you'd have two clear pie plates and you'd dump blue and red and yellow food coloring and you'd put it on the overhead and then he would project that behind us. And it was all psychedelia. So it, by some miracle, John's ticket was the winner for the free band show and he elected just to come along with us on our next gig. So it was kind of a scam. It was a total scam, okay. Uh, but you know, sometimes you do what you do to try and get by. We were all just scared kids throwing our hat in the arena, like jumping into the Coliseum with the Lions. Every gig was different. The Edgewood Yacht Club, people would storm the stage. The Barrington Yacht Club, a very prestigious gig, playing Satisfaction and Gloria to all of these older gentlemen that owned Boston Whalers and really cool power boats that we would only dream one day we would own. We played a lot of gigs and a lot of the Rhode Island bands. Rhode Island's a small state. 45 miles across. So there were maybe 30, 35 bands, tops. And you got to know everybody through a battle of the bands or whatnot. I've got a friend, Bob Angel, Bob Angel's Blues Outlet. And he releases his own self-produced blues CDs. And he is actually a Wing Chun Kung Fu teacher. And I'm a Wing Chun guy myself. So, a small coincidence, he was in a group called the Yeoman, and we probably played at a Battle of the Bands together. There was one at Crescent Park, which was the local amusement park, where we had seen Question Mark and the Mysterians do 96 tears there. That was a fun show and a whole different story. So, we're at this giant Battle of the Bands, and it was at the Alhambra Ballroom. So it was a mega ballroom for hundreds of people. 
and there were maybe seven bands on the act and just before we went on somebody slit Dave Brooks's snare drum head and our closing number was My Generation by The Who and, and we did the same thing we kicked all the stuff over and Dave would kick his amp out drums off and everything but without a snare drum you're totally host so we were doing the best we could and in the middle of our set you look down and you see like the parting of the Red Sea which is always there's a fight or two fights going on and people are just like backing out of the way and it's funny we're playing along me <laughs> people are going at it of course yeah, all the battle of the bands are rigged just like all of these contests are rigged so you've got to know that going in and just do it in good sport and try and gain a few new fans that's what we did so the entire time that the original oxbow incidents were together through those magical 60s years through the love and spoonful and the mamas and the papas and the jefferson airplane and country joe and the fish and moby grape and all of these groups came out during that time the jimmy hendrix experience cream the who eric clapton man it was just a great time to be alive nobody was worried unlike today nobody lived in fear we just lived for the next party and that's what we've got to go back to we've got to start projecting positive energy good things are going to happen love share the love that's it john lennon said it the word is love and say the word it's love so i'm going to go back to my mom always standing behind the band after we saw the yardbirds we decided we needed dual showmans fender dual showmans so mom co-signed for two of them one for me and one for john holsher the rhythm player and one day we were coming from rehearsal and we saw a couple of kids out on their little porch and they were trying to play some music i don't know what got into me i pulled the bus over and i said john let's pretend like we're talent scouts and he said okay so we we pulled up and we we stood there for a minute and listened and we said listen we're record talent scouts and we think you have great potential and we unloaded the dual showmans and we put them on their porch and said here, you guys play through this and let us hear how you sound. So they did, and their mom came out like, what is all this? And we said, yeah, you guys, you know, we're going to give you some dual showmans and get your band on, on track. And it came time to leave, and we put the showmans back in the, in the Volkswagen bus. And they said, oh, you're not going to leave these? Oh, we'll be back with the contract. And so hopefully we inspired them and they went on to greater heights are you experienced came out and we learned purple haze and fire and foxy lady and a lot of early jimmy songs we weren't that great at beatles songs because we weren't really good at harmonizing and chip was the best singer in the band so we stuck to our repertoire of animals and kinks and yard birds and uh, the Kingsmen, a few other people. But we noticed that life was changing for us. We had a sense of purpose. My grades got better in school. Before I started playing the guitar, my mind was scattered. It was just like, wow, there's so many thoughts. How do I organize them? What's going on? But when I started taking guitar lessons in October of 64, and went through Alfred's basic guitar method one through four by Christmas I thought the heck with this I want to play rock and roll 
then of course that February the Beatles were on Ed Sullivan and that blew the lid off everything. It was a social, musical, cultural revolution and they were leading the pack. Life magazine came out with a story about LSD and how it would deform your babies and ruin your mind and stuff and there were a bunch of us sitting around and discussing, well, would you ever take it? Oh, I don't know. What would you ever take it? So that uh question didn't get answered that day. Being in the band was not only like being in a boys club, but it was a camaraderie. When there's one guy trying to do it, it's one thing. When there's five people united going for the same thing, trying to make good music, it becomes something altogether else. And it's like you have a field of armor around you, actually. Now in 1965, the Beatles came out with Rubber Soul and they did the word, a John Lennon song, and the word was love. And that was kind of the beginning of the peace and the love movement, if you will. The Beatles artistically always led the movement for everybody else. As soon as they got onto something new, like on Revolver using tape loops, never before heard before, taking a studio from something that just records to making the studio an instrument. And so as soon as the Beatles would release another revolutionary album, everybody else would be trying to copy it. With Rubber Soul, they had Norwegian Wood and Michelle and Baby You Can Drive My Car. Just incredible songs. So. In 1967, when Lennon finally came out and said, all you need is love. Man, we were all for it. Everybody was for it. We were rebelling against our parents, really. The old aristocracy or the old, old guard of whatever it was. And we were taking it with the music, one step at a time. But the Beatles, for me and our group, they led the movement. We weren't good enough to play the majority of their songs, even a small fraction. So we got more into the animals and the kinks and the yardbirds and, you know, guitar bands. Eric Clapton, John Mayall and the Blues Breakers. John Holsher and I got that at the same time, and we listened to Pretty Woman and so many great songs were coming out of England. The U.S. was pretty stale for music. We had the Paul Butterfield Blues Band with Mike Bloomfield on guitar, and he was one of my big influences. When we were at camp, Dave Brooks had a friend who was actually in my grade, class of 68, Bruce McRae. He was really excellent on the harmonica. And I challenged him to learn Paul Butterfield's The Work Song. And he got the intro and the first few notes of the solo just perfect. So he'd often sit in with us at some of our gigs. He was a great supporter. One time our van broke down, it needed repairs. So we, I had a bunch of raffle tickets printed up. And the winner got our band to perform at a private party for them, for free. So we sold the tickets for a dollar and we raised enough to get the van fixed, the Volkswagen Bug or whatever it was called. And then everybody was in the auditorium and it was time to draw the notes, the, the winner. Well, we had made an ally of a guy named John Thomas. He worked in the AV lab. He was a student like us, but he had the keys. 
So after school closed on a Friday, he'd come back and he'd pick up the overhead projector. And those were in the days when you'd have two clear pie plates and you'd dump blue and red and yellow food coloring and you'd put it on the overhead and then he would project that behind us. And it was all psychedelia. So it, by some miracle, John's ticket was the winner for the free band show. And he elected just to come along with us on our next gig. So it was kind of a scam. It was a total scam, okay. Uh, but, you know, sometimes you do what you do to try and get by. We were all just scared kids throwing our hat in the arena like jumping into the Coliseum with the Lions. Every gig was different. The Edgewood Yacht Club, people would storm the stage. The Barrington Yacht Club, a very prestigious gig, playing Satisfaction and Gloria to all of these older gentlemen that owned Boston Whalers and really cool power boats that we would only dream one day we would own. We played a lot of gigs and a lot of the Rhode Island bands. Rhode Island's a small state, 45 miles across. So there were maybe 30, 35 bands tops. And you got to know everybody through a battle of the bands or whatnot. I'm uh, still in touch with a friend of mine from a band called The Yeoman. He's a Kung Fu, a Wing Chun Kung Fu man, Bob. And he plays blues and has his own label and puts out his own records. It's pretty cool. Well, we were doing really well. And then in my senior year, in Bob's junior year, he had to move to Northbrook, Illinois. And that was a crushing blow to us because Bob's organ playing was great. He was a character. We had so much fun. It was like being in a boys club all the time. That's what being in a band was like back then. And everything was just magical. And we all had cool girlfriends. And I guess they started calling them groupies or hippie chicks or whatnot. But a lot of people would remark, when your band used to come and play, you were all dressed so unusually. And your girlfriends, too, they had the clothes to match. You guys were something else. And we really were. The Yardbirds came to play at Brown University's spring weekend. That was a massive, massive party every year. And they had great entertainers. James Brown and the Little Rascals and Ray Charles and whatnot, depending on who was hot that year. The Yardbirds were on the last nine weeks of their American tour, and then they were going to go back to England and break up. To our good fortune, we were standing out front when the bus pulled up and the roadie came out, and I introduced myself and offered our services to help them as guides around the campus or anything they needed. Well, about that time, the promoters came out and said, you know, it looks like rain. Maybe we should move this over to another venue, the Mian Auditorium. They didn't know how to get there. So my whole band jumped on the bus and we said, we'll show you. So we're on the bus and Keith Ralph says, hey, I'm Keith Ralph and this is Jimmy Page and here's Jimmy McCarty, our drummer, and here's Chris Drejaw, the bass player. And so we got goofing and clowning and we sat over in the Mian Auditorium parking lot 10 or 20 minutes. They decided, no, let's move back to the original spot. So we got to hang around with them and meet our first real rock stars. And boy, talk about association amongst people that you want to be like. So we, we told them, uh, hey, we're doing, actually it was Dave mentioned to Jim McCarty, Hey, we're doing a TV show tomorrow and we're playing a couple of your songs. And Jimmy McCarty said, oh yeah, what are you playing? And 
And Dave said, well, mister, you're a better man than I and heart full of soul. I said, oh, that's really cool. Well, they took off and that was basically that. One other thing I will add, in the summer of 68, I elected not to go back as a camp counselor. John Holzer, the rhythm guitar player, followed suit. So we hitchhiked to Chicago to see Bob, our old keyboard player. Well, Bob had a friend named Marty who was a cool guy and he had a lot of orange sunshine. That was LSD. And so we, we took it and we put on the Cream album and we were hallucinating and just tripping out. And it was a very mind-blowing experience, as you can imagine. Well, it came time to leave Bob's and John and I had a big job with the Ralph Stewart Orchestra playing in Monroeville, Pennsylvania for Alfred Hunt, the silver tycoon at the time, his goddaughter's coming out party. It was an amazing experience and very lavishly catered and everything. And we were going to play down at the swimming pool in the pool house. And he had an artificial geyser, it cost him $50,000 to run every half hour like Old Faithful. So we're down there playing at the pool house and having a great time. And on the break, I got to talking to a, an older gentleman. And I said, well, what do you do? And he said, oh, I used to play baseball. I said, really, what team? He said, the Chicago White Sox. Um, only when I played them with them in the World Series, we got called the Chicago Black Sox because we, a bunch of us agreed to throw the game for the mob. And they were later discovered. And my dad, who wanted to be a professional baseball player, Shoeless Joe Jackson was a big idol to him. And he was a pitcher on the team. He was charged, but later he was vindicated. Well, after the show, for some reason, the chief of police of the town took a fancy to me. And he invited me and Jim and maybe John over to his house. Uh, and we were left alone in his kitchen. And he went upstairs and passed out. We had some weed, so we took it out and were there smoking it in his kitchen. We got a ride back to the pool house and it was time to go home. Well, coming down to the gig was Jim Carr, the bass player, and Jim Whittle, who was a friend of ours, who would sit in whenever Dave Brooks couldn't make it. Kind of like Ringo sat in for Pete Best. Well, the, the bus blew up in New Haven, Connecticut. And so they had to put everything on a Greyhound bus and drive it down there. When John and I went to meet them and we saw this Greyhound bus, we said, where's the van? They said, it blew up. Wow. So we rented a Ford Galaxy 500. We got the PA system, the drums, all the amps, and five of us into this Ford. Three of us were in the front seat. It was really crowded driving home, let me tell you. But we made it and everything turned out well. Well, the following fall, the Jeff Beck group came to the Boston Tea Party. Opening act was Jethro Tull. I was standing in the audience, the same road manager walked by, Henry Smith, I think was his name. He said, hey, good to see you. Come backstage and meet the lads. So there I was with Jeff Beck and Rod Stewart and Ronnie Wood and Mick Waller. Talk about standing amongst greatness. It was just unbelievable. And he put me on the guest list for the next night 
I brought my high school girlfriend, Mary Baker, with me, and we watched the whole show from the wings. It was so cool. Then later, in February, Led Zeppelin came, and the same road manager, and he introduced me to all of Robert Plant and Bonzo and John Paul Jones and Jimmy's, of course, I had met. That was unbelievable. Well, the Oxbow incidents were kind of coming to the end of the run, and after Bob left the band, we hired an organ player named Todd Urbanus. He was an accordion player when he was six, like a prodigy, winning countless contests. But he had a Hammond B3, and it sounded really good. But Todd was a very strong personality, as was I. Well, Jack decided in the fall, like most of the guys, they were going off to college. We need a new lead singer. And Todd had been in a group with a guy named Bruce Gasper. Before Bruce and Todd came in, we were like a high school teenage band like the Beatles in Hamburg in 1959. Well, Bruce came in and Bruce was kind of olive complected, was a big heavy guy, had a real thick beard, and it was a completely different image. When the Cream came out and they were playing Marshall amps and Hendrix was playing Marshalls, well, we needed Marshalls. Bruce had a van that was a converted bread truck, I think. And my mom co-signed maybe a $3,500 loan in 1968 for 200 watt double stack Marshalls. Well, we drove to Long Island to the factory to pick them up. And on the way back, the truck was overheating and the radiator blew. And we didn't have any water, so we kept stopping along the road, getting as far as we could, and would take some Coke bottles empty and would find a little brook or little water in a ditch and would come back and try and put it in the radiator after it had cooled down. It took us about six hours to get home, but we finally made it home. Todd booked us for a job at his high school senior prom. It was at a place called Eileen Darlings. Now the Yardbirds had played there on a tour with, and they made a record out of it. Nobody really knew who they were, but we did. And Jeff Beck was my guitar hero. In fact, on the Over Under Sideways Down album, he played a song called Jeff's Boogie, and it involved a bunch of pull-offs and hammer-ons. Well, we were playing a club called the Hullabaloo Scene, which the Hullabaloo show was a big TV show that all of the kids watched. So we were playing at the Hullabaloo Club, and the Yardbirds had played there the week before with a local band. The kid from the local band showed up and said, hey, Jeff showed me how to play Jeff's Boogie. And I said, well, show me. And he taught it to me, and I played it correctly from that point on. So Jeff Beck was already a big hero of mine before we met the Yardbirds and after Jeff Beck had left. But we saw the Fellini film, Blow Up, where Jeff was playing a Les Paul and Jimmy Page was playing the bass, I think. And Jeff was having some trouble. It was all staged. But the next thing you see is him smashing his guitar into the amp because he couldn't get the sound. But they, they had substituted like a Pinocchio guitar or something that he actually smashed. He didn't smash his real gold top. That was a fabulous guitar. It sounded unbelievable, especially on the Jeff Beck Truth album. So we're playing at Eileen Darlings and we had been through one set and I got a great big soda and I put it on the Marshall. And on, on the first song, the vibrations were so heavy, it spilled over into the head and it blew it up. That was not a good thing. 
But we got through the night with the assistance of two of us plugging into one amplifier. These were the days where we all started growing our hair long, almost getting thrown out of school. And after school, at four o'clock, the Lloyd Thaxton show was on. And I remember running home from the bus stop just in time to get that show on. He had a lot of American groups like Paul Revere and the Raiders and uh, the Kingsmen and, you know, other people. But the point is we were seeing live music and we could see it almost every afternoon. That was a real inspiration to us to keep going. So after John had left the band, Bruce Gasper came in, Jack Ryan was gone. Jim Carr was still with us. He was going to Northwestern University. I was hanging around Boston and I saw an advertisement for the Boston Rock Symphony. And I said, I'm gonna try out for that. But we had one more job in New Bedford at the Orchid Room on Valentine's Day, 1969. We played it, it was a fun gig. And my friend Johnny Barnes remembers cutting across through the graveyard, coming down the street, and hearing me play with the Wawa and the Echoplex. He said, I couldn't believe it. I had to get closer for another look. And I came up to the window and I saw this guy with really long hair and a purple satin shirt and purple velvet pants and wicked boots playing guitar. I said, I want to do that. Well, we finished the last job of the Oxbow Incidents, as I said, at the Orchid Room, and I auditioned for the Rock Symphony. It was an 11-piece rock band with the Boston Pops and Arthur Fiedler, and we were scheduled to go around the world. Opening day was at Symphony Hall. James Montgomery, the blues harmonica player, was in the rock band. He couldn't read music, but he could play. So the music director knew that, and so he didn't care. He just told James what the key was, and when he pointed at James, he'd play a nice solo. Well, there were two guitar players, myself and Melvin Wax, who was a Berkeley student. Melvin said, why don't you come by my pad tomorrow at three, and we'll jam. And I thought, well, this is a good time for us to get to know each other a little better. So I came over at three, he opened the door and he said, have a seat. I'm just finishing up my homework. And he was sight reading Mozart on his classical guitar and playing some wicked piece. And I thought, oh my God, this guy's great. He's going to kill me. I got to get out of here. So I picked up my stuff to leave and Mel said, no, wait a minute. Don't go anywhere. I'm done. I'm done. Let's play. I said, well, okay. And he got out his electric and I got out mine. And he said, uh, what do you want to do? He said, I don't know, let's jam some Hendrix. I said, okay. So we started playing and I sounded like Hendrix and he sounded like Mozart. And I thought, holy smokes, this guy's going to Berkeley School of Music, probably the most prestigious music college in the country. And I just smoked him on the electric guitar. He was all head and no soul. And that was a tremendous lesson. I said, I'm going to go as far as I can go, learning and playing and ingesting the styles of everything that I like to hear and build my style from there. And when I've gone as far as I can go, then I'll go to some kind of a music conservatory. And that served me very well. Well, the, the Rock Symphony, that was kind of a bust because the symphony orchestra never rehearsed with the rock band because they just read the score. They, you know, they, they're professionals. They didn't need to rehearse. But what no one counted on was a rock band with double stack marshals eight feet from the string section. So the lights went down. You can hear the 
everybody, you know, the orchestra kind of humming away there. And all of a sudden the curtain opens and there's the Boston Pops and they're playing this beautiful whatever. And we came out with our marshals and just blew them away. Their eardrums exploded, their toupees went flying off their heads and they just got up and quickly left the stage. We didn't know what to do, so I said, blues shuffle in G. One, two, three, and we jumped in and we're playing this smoke and shuffle and we got about maybe 35 seconds into it and they cut the power so you could hear this as the power closed down, the curtain closed and the Boston Rock Symphony round the world tour was canceled. That was disappointing. So as we're into 1969 and the, the Rock Symphony had broken up, but the Newport Jazz and Folk Festival was coming and so was Woodstock. Well, I couldn't make Woodstock. I had a motorcycle and not enough money for the gas. And when I learned the New York State Thruway was closed, I said, forget about it. But I did go to the three-day festival in Newport, which was just mind-blowing. Probably 1979, when I came back from my Hollywood years, I stopped at a Kentucky Fried Chicken and it was really cold. There was only one table and I sat down at it. Well, four more guys came in. They looked about my age. They ordered up, but they had no place to sit. So I said, you guys can sit with me. Come on over, join me. So we got to talking and I had mentioned that I was a musician and had played in this area a long, long time ago. And one guy said, uh, oh, I went to Cranston High School. Did you ever play there? And I said, once in a battle of the bands. And he said, were you that guy with the top hat and the fringe coat that was rolling around the stage? He said, you guys were great. I would have voted for you, but it was a political thing. I, was, I understood and they thanked me for sharing my table and I thanked them for the camaraderie and off I went. Well, 1969 ended up with a bang with me spending a lot of time at the Boston Tea Party, meeting tons of rock stars and getting ready for whatever the 1970s were going to bring. But it's a particular meaning and significance to me because 59 years ago, this coming New Year's Eve, 2024, I will have been a professional musician for 59 years. So that is my closing message to you. And what I take away from all of the 60s Oxbow incident experience and the complete revolution that we all went through. It was a cultural change. It was incredible. My friends, if you've enjoyed my video book, because this is probably the next to the last story since I saved the beginning for last. I want to thank all of you who have become friends with me, who have left wonderful comments and have really made my last two years joyous since I embarked on this project. If it's in your heart, it would help my channel a lot if you liked it and shared it with a friend. But my message to you and all of you is not only thank you, but keep love in your heart and a song in your head. And I will see you down the musical story highway on the next adventure of the old time rock and roller. So long, my friends. Happy New Year.